So following on that very exciting discussion of technology, we have a, um, uh, another discussion related to technology. Um, fracking, what can New York learn from, from and teach the rest of the nation? Uh, and to lead that discussion, we are very pleased to have Winona Howder, who is the Executive Director of Food and Water Watch. Uh, she's worked extensively on food, water, energy, and environmental issues at the national, state, and local level. Her recent book, Foodopoly, The Battle Over the Future of Food and Farming in America, examines the corporate consolidation and control over our food system and what it means for eaters and producers. Winona has also been uh, uh, the policy director for Citizen Action. Uh, she was at the Union of Concerned Scientists as a senior organizer, uh, where she coordinated broad-based, grassroots, sustainable energy campaigns in several states. Uh, and we are very happy to have Winona here with us today. Thank you. Thanks so much. <clears throat> Well, I've been thrilled to be here at this conference because I grew up on a farm and I actually own a farm that my husband runs as a CSA outside of DC. So I'm always happy to come and be a part of food conferences. Unfortunately, we are going to be talking about a technology that's actually threatening our food system. I work for an organization called Food and Water Watch, and we have 17 offices around the country, and we're engaged in fighting fracking out of all of those offices. So today we're going to talk about fracking. We're going to talk about the terrific campaign here in New York State, which is so well organized and has been able to keep so far fracking out of the state. And we're going to talk about other states and what's going on there. To kick us off, I want to say a little bit about what fracking is. So there are a couple of things that you should know before our discussion starts. First of all, we always hear that fracking is all about gas. Today, 80% of fracking is for oil because the price of natural gas is low and the price of oil is high. Fracking is exempt from all of our national environmental laws, and many states are not providing any oversight over fracking. So what is fracking for those of you who don't live in one of the 34 states where it's being proposed or already taking place or who aren't following this very closely? Fracking is the use of very highly pressurized water to go down very deep in wells that have been drilled as far as a mile down in the ground. The water is mixed with very fine silica sand and a host of cancer-causing and other types of chemicals that are used to loosen the oil, oil or gas from very hard rock, shale, often. And the wells not only go down as far as a mile into the ground vertically, they go now as far as three miles out horizontally in, uh, in some places in the country. So you can imagine that this creates a number of problems that we're going to discuss today and things that are going to affect our food system and, in fact, are already affecting our food system in the places where uh, it's going on aggressively. So our first speaker today, um, we're very fortunate to have three people who are very knowledgeable about this issue and uh, uh, involved in it from a food point of view. Ken Jaffe is a former general practice physician, and he farms 100 uh, and 25 miles northwest of New York, uh, raising 160 head of grass-fed beef at Slope Farm. And uh, this is located on the historic turnpike road that was built in 1803 to bring food into uh, uh, the New York City region. So pretty interesting that that's where Ken is farming today. And he can tell you about his grass-fed operation. He markets his beef and the beef of 15 other regional producers. And if fracking comes to New York, 
Ken's farming operation is going to be threatened. Ken? Thanks. Well, I'd rather be talking about um, things that are more joyful, like uh, turning upland uh, marginal land into beautiful, productive grassland that's a kind of a self-sustaining eco ecosystem with uh, large ruminants and grass. But alas, that's not why I was asked to come down. Um, so I'll talk some about fracking and how it affects um, farming and, and farm productivity and, and farmer health. Um, a couple more points just about the specifics of how fracking is done. Um, you know, the, the Marsalis Shale has already been divided up into one square mile grid. Uh, and there would be, if it were a full uh, build out, as there was, say, in Wyoming and Colorado, you would have one well pad per square mile. On each of those well pads, there will be approximately 8 to 12, so average 10 wells. Each well, drill, uh, fracking each well takes about 5 million gallons of water. Uh, each well will be fracked, you know, eight to 12 times. So uh, you're talking about many, many millions of gallons of water that has to be transported by truck. There are hundreds of truck transports uh, filled with this fracking fluid uh, to, for each fracking, and that has to be brought in, stored, pumped down, uh, pumped out, and then pumped and then carried away. Um, with this very, you know, dense complex of roads and pipelines because all the gas has to go out on pipelines. So the land again gets divided up with this network, this spider web of pipelines, uh, for, uh, kind of dividing up the, the farmland. Um, so, you know, we often hear that, well, the amount of chemicals that are in there is just 2%. But if you just do the arith arithmetic, each well pad will have about two and a half million gallons of chemicals pumped into the ground through the aquifer, which is where the groundwater goes, uh, comes from, that people drink and animals drink, and, uh, and then goes uh, into the sub, the sub aquifer zone. Uh, and you know, we now have pretty good evidence from EPA studies and, uh, and from uh, university studies that there is leakage from those wells into the aquifer. Um, so, um, just to talk some about the regu regulatory structure, we want to mention that, um, that there's a very bizarre situation where, um, where the toxic effects of fracking are exempt from federal environmental laws. So, if benzene shows up in drinking water, benzene is banned by the Safe Drinking Water Act at more than five parts per billion. If benzene shows up in your drinking water, uh, from fracking, the federal government has no oversight of that. And, you know, the, and the EPA did studies in when there was contamination of the aquifer in Wyoming and found benzene at 50 times the level that's permitted. Uh, but the, the net effect that the EPA did was they turned over regulation to the state of Wyoming, uh, which is uh, not going very well. Um, in New York State, we don't have fracking yet. Um, there is something called a, uh, an envir draft environmental impact statement, which has to be decided on, and that's in a state of limbo now. There's no official um, uh, um, uh, moratorium, but there is this kind of uh, limbo state involving the environmental impact study. There were tens of thousands of comments, mostly objecting to various aspects of it. So, and Cuomo is, um, you know, I think trying to do everything he can to not make a decision. Um, his Department of Health head, Shah, who recently left, has written some, you know, very compelling um, letters about fracking, you know, looking at it from a pe public health point of view, which I'll comment on a little later. But just to just to review specifically some of the impacts on, um, on, on farming. I mean, the first thing is that there will be less farming if there's fracking. And we know this because there's studies from Penn State and Cornell, which are the two leading agricultural research universities in the region, which looked at impacts in, in Pennsylvania. And they found there was like a 30% drop in, in output from dairy farms in counties where fracking was happening at a high level. That's in terms of amount of gallons milked, amount of dollars produced by those farms. 
Um, we, we have really strong reason to believe that productivity of individual farms will go down because of the pollution. The biggest risk there is ozone. You know, we see in Wyoming and Sublette County, which is this incredibly rural county, there's a very strong, big build out in terms of fracking and there's, um, there's higher ozone levels than in Los Angeles, for instance. And there's abundant research from California on ozone and, and crops because they've had you know, so much pollution problems there in the past. Uh, the EPA, uh, I'm sorry, the USDA says that um, ozone damages more crops more than all other air pollutants put together. Uh, NASA says $2 billion a year in damage from ozone to soybeans alone. Uh, so, you know, we, we have crops in New York that are specifically sensitive to ozone, in particular grapes, and, you know, from my point of view, certain, you know, grazing plants, uh, clover in particular, are considered like sentinel species. You can sort of plant them, and if there's ozone, you can watch them die as a way of, you know, being alert to ozone problems. Uh, livestock health is another big concern. There's now been some good s data published by uh, two Cornell uh, scientists, uh, uh, Osborne and Bam uh, Bamberger, uh, and they looked at impacts on animal health, uh, all instances of spills, because, because of all the transport of toxic water in and toxic water out, there are m many surface spills which are uh, significant in terms of quantity, generally unreported livestock are generally drinking from surface waters, from ponds and streams, you know, so there's uh, many case reports of, of animal deaths, stillbirths uh, from Pennsylvania, Louisiana, and other fracking states. Uh, there are significant concerns about food safety, which have been voiced uh, by a lot of people, including Christopher Portier, who's the CDC's head of the Environmental Health Division, who said that studies should be done to, um, for all sources of exposure to fracking toxins, including air, water, soil, plants, and animals. There, is no, there has been no research done on this. There's been no follow-up by the CDC. Um, and there's problems for farmers' point of view from consumer acceptance because, you know, my largest wholesale buyers have expressed publicly that they will not be buying from areas where there's intensive fracking. So, you know, I have pretty strong reason to believe that I would be basically out of business if there was fracking near me. Um, and there are serious risks we now know from studies on farmer health. Um, you know, very good literature published out of the University of Colorado School of Public Health. And this year there was two studies on, uh, from Princeton, Columbia, MIT, and Cornell scientists on birth defects and pr risk to pregnancy. They found there was double the risk of spinal br and, and brain malformations in newborns, 30% increase in, in congenital heart disease, and a 60% increase in low birth weight uh, newborns. This is uh, studies published this year. Now, these studies are all coming from, uh, funded by research universities or funded by the foundations. There is essentially zero research being done by any public health entity at the federal level or at, at any state level. So, you know, the, the policy of don't ask, don't tell has been sort of transported from gays in the military to fracking. We're in a, in a zone of like, you know, a scientific blackout. And the information that's coming through is coming from, um, you know, self-funded self university sources. Um, I mean, what is, how is New York different? Um, New York is different because New York has not okayed fracking. And we've had, you know, health officials who have, who have um, you know, had kind of rational health approach. And I'll just quote briefly from Senator Shaw's letter to Cuomo which he said, the decision to permit high fracking is important and involves complex questions about the impact of the process on public health. The time to ensure the impacts on public health is pro are properly considered is before the state permits drilling. Other states began serious health reviews only after proceeding with widespread fracking. And then he recommends waiting for the results of three studies, EPA, Geisinger, and University of Pennsylvania. None of those three, those three studies have actually started to collect data. That's the current status of the science. Thanks, Ken. Uh, I think that you cannot underestimate 
the power of the oil and gas industry in public policy making in this country. Just in, the, in 2013, they gave $144 million in campaign contributions to members of Congress. And they have basically been able to use their power to shut down the EPA uh, research. So none of the water pollution studies that were supposed to be done are moving forward. And they have been able to influence uh, members of the Senate to support exports of natural gas, which means that communities here will become uh, more of sacrifice zones as gas is exported, uh, which is both very dangerous from these LNG terminals that need to be built uh, and all of the pipelines that need to be built. It means the price of gas will go up here and it means that it will be uh, uh, make it more beneficial to the oil and gas industry to have a higher price of gas. So that's what this whole debate about exports is about. And just to follow up on what Ken said, there are now 150 different studies done by respected research institutions on the impacts of uh, gas and oil fracking. And uh, there are also uh, a thousand different spills and accidents were um, researched by ProPublica, and that was a couple of years ago, and there have been a lot more since then. So we're next going to hear from Peter Hoffman, who is going to talk about uh, extreme energy from his point of view as a chef and as a citizen. And uh, he's the chef owner of Savoy. He's been there for 24 years, and he's had the back 40 since 2007. He's known for his patronage of the green market here in New York City and local farmers, and he's uh, had a lot of long-standing relationships with those farmers that have uh, made it possible for him to use a lot of their ingredients in the dishes that he's created. And he's served on the board of the Chef's Collaborative, and he's uh, very involved in Chefs of the Marcellus. Peter? Great, thanks, Winona. <clears throat> um, you know, I, I did a talk uh, a year ago and wrote an article uh, in Edible Manhattan about fracking, um, and it's there, still online. I recommend it to you. Um, I went into um, sort of my perspective as a, as a chef who depends on gas directly um, for the work that I do, for the income that I produce, for the excitement that I generate with people, um, that is, is that we cook, and we cook with natural gas. And um, so we're all, uh, we're all users of fossil fuels at this point. Um, every one of us. And um, so it's not about the fact that fossil fuel consumption is bad. It has to do with how are we using it, what are we using it for, and, and, it, and, it, and remembering that it's a limited resource, right? We're past 50%. So part of what happens if we're using it up is, is that people get more desperate and decide that the trade-off is greater to, in, in order to say we can take more risky, we can get, be involved in more risky behavior because we, can we need to continue to extract uh, the fossil fuels. That's what I think a lot of what the fracking is about, is that um, this is accessing fuel that hadn't been accessible before and we're being told that this is an important trade-off to make. So regardless of my position sort of as a cook and as a, as a, as a chef citizen, I feel like this, the argument or the discussion about fracking and about natural gas um, and, and fossil fuel consumption in general is something that's in the, uh, in the conversation, the national conversation at the moment. You know, uh, there was an op-ed piece last week that, that Mike Bloomberg uh, 
and uh, someone from NRDC wrote, um, talking about that fracking, uh, that, that maybe we could continue to go with fracking um, if it was studied, regulated, tested, and, and, uh, and, and understood. And so I, wanted, I want your takeaway today to be not just that fracking isn't a, uh, uh, the right method for us to be going down, but to be in, able to engage in the argument that fracking is um, part of the national or the worldwide energy conversation that we have to have. So um, I want to consider all of you um, to, and myself to be a conservative, right? I think that, that the term conservative has been hijacked by um, the right wing, by people who are wantonly um, not conserving and wasting what we were given on this planet to protect. So we're all conservatives. And um, that went, so it has to do with our natural resources, our environment, our economic health. Um, all of that as an outgrowth of our utilization of our natural resources. So, um, it, I, I think that the, you know, that, that the effect of fossil fuel consumption um, affects worldwide climate. We know about that. We're hearing about that all the time. Environmental policy, foreign policy, domestic economic policy, and our social agenda. It is vast. It is deep. And it is, you know, I, some of you may have been at West Jackson and Wendell Berry's talk, and one of them, I don't remember which one, talked about the dragon in the death throes. And that's about um, whether it's at our economic system or the, the agricultural system um, that uh, is in its death throes. I think of it more as the, uh, that plant in the little shop of horrors that has its tendrils that's crawling into every aspect of our lives. So um, we're all touched by it, right? And, um, and the new technology is reckless. And as uh, both Ken and, and Winona have pointed out, we don't have federal oversight on the issue any longer. And the reason for that, go go watch my talk or read the article, has to do with the wonderful Vice President Cheney who completely overthrew, he, he absconded with what we gained in the 70s with that other horrible Vice President, um, Richard Nixon, but he became my hero in that he passed and under his administration passed the Clean uh, Air Act and the, and the uh, Pure Water Act, and we lost the federal control over these pollution issues. So, um, what are we to do? Um, you know, uh, we have to, it's, it's wonderful that we're here in New York State um, in a position where there's a moratorium on it, that we can continue to talk about the issue and, uh, and hopefully stop it by educating ourselves um, and others uh, why this isn't the right route to, to be going down. New techniques always excite the energy companies because they're desperate for profit um, and um, they're willing to trade our permanent water supply for short-term gain and, and profit, or short-term energy, right? Permanent water, short-term energy. We're kicking the problem down the road about our energy consumption and, and embracing renewables. So here's one of the takeaways. Everybody's gonna talk to you about natural gas is the bridge between coal 
and renewables. It's bullshit, okay? It, because, I'll tell you why it is. You could, it's a bridge because we're just kicking the problem down the road. When fracking proliferated in the last few years, the result was is that, that uh, natural gas prices plummeted. So much so, in fact, that one of the largest companies involved in it, Chesapeake Energy, went bankrupt because they bet on a higher price for energy prices. But um, um, as long as energy prices are artificially depressed, and what I mean by artificially depressed is if we're not willing to make sure that our health and our landscape and our water and our air are protected, then it's an it's a, uh, uh, unnatural price, then we're not going to invest in renewables because they are more expensive. So when price, oil prices or energy prices go up, it's worth investing in renewables. And as long as we frack, we're not gonna, it's not gonna be economically viable to, for solar and wind. So we're kicking it down the road. That's a bridge to nowhere, all right? Don't believe it. Coal is not great. It's wonderful to be getting off of coal. And I think it's terrific that the Supreme Court did at least one right thing this year by supporting the EPA in their right to regulate uh, emissions. But um, it's not it's not enough. So people who are talking about the bridge, it's a bridge to nowhere. The other thing that I want to make you aware of is, is that, it, and, and it gets into foreign policy immediately, it's like I woke up to hear on the news one day that uh, when the whole uh, uh, Crimea, Ukraine crisis started to come up was is that, oh, we have to support the freedom fighters in, in Ukraine and in Europe. Um, and um, ship them liquid natural gas. And the problem, the, the, what's interfering with this is um, uh, regulations and restrictions on uh, transportation of natural gas. So we. We can't get duped into thinking that um, uh, we should forsake environmental standards because of foreign policy goals. So um, those are some of the takeaways that I want you to have as, as, as citizens. Um, my work as a chef has been to think about my, is I'm a chef citizen, right? Each of you in your careers, whether it's in cooking or in writing, or whatever, is both um, the, the working that you do and the citizen of the world. And so I'm here continuing to bond with chefs for the Marcellus, chefs around the country, to say our impacts are important, they affect other people, and we have to not just do car ads, and, um, and, and make money off of that, um, we, have to, we have to live our lives as if we're imp to improve the world. Um, and so now, uh, I'm, I, you know, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Will's gonna talk a little bit more about um, Chefs for the Marcellus and the work that we've done as a group. But back to you, Winona. Yeah, I wanna just tease out one thing before we move on to Will, and that's, how New York is different. And I think there are a couple of things that make New York stand out. Number one, organizing. The organizing began in 2009 when people in Ithaca saw the devastation in Pennsylvania. Some people began organizing community bands and in fact figured out a, a legal mechanism to make it work in New York. There are now 400 bands, uh, community bands across the <coughs> country. Uh, in two, 2010, um, Governor Patterson uh, put out an executive order that made a temporary moratorium in New York, and at the same time, he had vetoed a bill that would have uh, actually made a two-year moratorium. 
There was so much fight back when he did that organizing that uh, the governor, the current governor, has never been able to move forward. And there have been a number of different policy things that have happened. Uh, we're lucky that in New York there's a review, an environmental review process that doesn't exist in other states. The other thing I want to note are the coalitions that formed. We're going to hear about one that Will's going to talk about, but I want to point out New Yorkers Against Fracking, which is a coalition that now has 250 organizations in the state of New York that have bird dogged the governor. The governor uh, cannot go anywhere without running into uh, fracking activists. There have been rallies. There have been uh, buses to Albany, I, I don't know how many times, petition drives. Uh, the coalition was able to be funded and hired a, uh, a media company to help do the media work. Uh, Artists Against Fracking with Yoko Ono, Sean um, Lennon uh, has been very helpful. And a number of other musicians have uh, kicked in doing concerts. So there has been a lot of organizing, and it's made Governor Cuomo afraid to move forward. And I think that's the fundamental important lesson for people to take away across the country. And now many other states, we see the same type of organizing, even in Ohio, Colorado, California, across the country. And I think what we're learning from states like Pennsylvania is that fracking is a disaster for farmland and really leaves it a, a sacrifice zone. And one of the very important coalition partners here in New York has been uh, Chefs for the Marcellus. I want to give a shout out to Hilary Baum, who I know is out there, who's been instrumental in uh, uh, helping to form that, and also New Yorkers um, Sustainable Businesses Against Fracking. So Will? Okay, so I want to first thank the Edible community and Brian for putting this uh, topic and subject in the spotlight. That's huge. So a round of applause for the Edible community for that. Um, there are precious number of panels, uh, discussions, and uh, to have fracking be one of them is, uh, is huge. And also I'm honored to be with the three of you on stage, so thank you. Um, I wanted to just... Uh, Quickly, before I get into what I had planned, I, I just wanted to um, note a NOAA study that came out a, a few days ago. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to just say, this whole thing about um, um, gas as a bridge is interesting because I don't, I think the jury is out on natural gas. Um, and uh, this, particularly the fracking method and the methane that's released. So the NOAA study basically, um, I think the statistics were maybe that three times more methane than previously thought um, ends up being released um, from these wells. And methane is 34 times more destructive to our ozone layer. So just think about that for a second, because I think we kind of already uh, accepted and swallowed the concept that gas is better than. So the answer is really renew investing in renewables and our infrastructure and how we distribute um, uh, electricity, I think. But. Um, um, and I wanted to just start by talking a little bit about how I got into this. I, four years ago, I, was, I had no idea what fracking was. I had no, um, uh, no knowledge, and I certainly wasn't involved in, the, in, the, in this movement. And uh, my girlfriend, Autumn, who's here, grew up on a 60-acre garlic farm in Steuben County. And in visiting her, I learned a lot about fracking, which was you know, terrifying. But there are two things that I learned about their situation. So whatever you think about fracking, um, even let's just say you, you, you think fracking is okay uh, if it's regulated well, which I don't, you know, I don't think that. But if you're a landowner in Steuben County, like my girlfriend's family, um, there's a statute in New York State and Pennsylvania and 20 other states where through forced pooling, you can be forced to actually allow fracking to happen if 60% in New York State um, of your neighbors agree to, um, to lease their land to the, these gas companies. Which, I mean, I think that's also terrifying. Um, 
And so if 60% of these um, neighbors of yours uh, agree, then they can petition the state and they can get, um, basically, you, have, you can opt out. Um, the other thing is there's a, an assumption that all of your neighbors are your neighbors, like your friends, you know, Larry down the street or Susie up the street or whatever. Um, in many cases, you know, the, the people are investing in land and buying land. And so you have out-of-state folks from Pennsylvania that might have made some money that are now investing in these areas. And so there's not, um, you know, kind of like the natural safety of um, the people living around you needing to worry about um, what fracking is going to do to the community. Anyway, um, so that's how I got into it. I'm not going to get into fracking and the case against fracking because you all did such a great job. Great. Um, well, I got the word that because other panels went over that we don't have very much time left. So I want to take some questions. If people line up. <laughs> Can you talk? You didn't really... Oh, oh, sorry. oh I no, that's fine. Said, I don't... No, okay. I thought no, you no, no. said you were done. Just give me one. Just give me one minute. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Was it that? Was it that bad? Um, okay. Okay. Quick. Uh, just. I'm going to be really quick. Okay. Yeah. So. So basically, um, I'm part of an organization called Chefs for Marsalis. Um, Hillary Baum, Heather Carlucci, who's a pastry chef, and uh, Jimmy Carbone, who's a chef here in New York City, founded it. And um, uh, I'm an observer as an editor um, in a food magazine of. Um, the chef world and the food, the food world. But what I wanted to quickly just say is that we have had a lot of success, and the question is why. And um, I, I, as an observer, see in our industry a chain of trust. Uh, a chain of trust that's very fragile, um, where diners need to rely upon chefs, and chefs re need to rely upon farmers, and we all re need to rely upon our government and regulators to, um, to keep our food safe. But without that trust, um, chefs and uh, restaurant owners who are small businesses, who do create jobs, who are a big part of our economy, um, they have no business. And you look at the Brooklyn Co-op who's stopped buying from the frack zone in Pennsylvania, and you see how fragile that chain of trust is. So I think that's a very important thing to think about. Um, it's also a source of power, and I think that's a lot of what our campaign is about. Chefs also, in that, on the flip side of that, have an immense amount of power because they do build quite a bit of trust and credibility with their diners, who are also constituents of our governor and our government, um, and and farmers and producers, um, uh, uh, breweries and wineries. They are all businesses that are very important of what we to what we do. So, in any case. Um, we launched this campaign. I, the main thing is, what did you learn? What did we learn from New York for other states? Um, all of you can do it. You're from edible communities all around the country. Um, you can do it with zero budget. You need to start with really good people like uh, Hillary and Jimmy and Heather and all the people that are part of our community. We have over 250 uh, folks in the industry have signed up, signed a petition, and sent a very clear, strong message as business owners, as uh, food influencers, um, to the governor. And we, uh, we pulled fundraisers together. And we basically just found like-minded businesses, um, like Vertura that's here, uh, Brooklyn Winery, Oma Gang, a bunch of um, top chefs, including Peter, to come together and raise money and fuel ourselves without the need for uh, super PACs. So we are short on time. My Twitter handle's up there. I'll be here afterwards. If you'd like some advice on how to um, feel empowered in your community, just uh, come talk to us. Will, do you want to give your website? Oh, uh, yeah, so it's chefsfromarsalis.org. Uh, Hillary Baum is over here. We are um, trying to expand our pool of petitions, and so please join us. Looks like we should have 200, 300 more people. <laughs> Let me give two more websites because I'm afraid we are going to be out of time. Um, 
New Yorkers Against Fracking for People from New York has a lot of information about the coalition. Food and Water Watch, uh, you can learn more about the export battle and all of the campaigns going on across the country. That's foodandwaterwatch.org, and the other one is newyorkersagainstfracking.org. Thanks so much, and I know you can speak with everyone on the panel afterwards, and I'm sorry that we're out of time. Do we have do we have time for questions? No, he said no. That's why I was rushing oh. it along. No time for Q and A. Behind in the schedule, That's so why um, I was hopefully this is just the beginning of the discussion, and we can continue it. And uh, I appreciate very much all the panelists coming. So okay. thank you. Uh, I also uh, now. Uh, I also wanted to invite up now um, uh, a few members of our favorite organic dairy cooperative, Organic Valley, who are here to tell us a little bit about their company and the cheeses and other dairy products that we've been tasting outside. Uh, please welcome uh, Crystal, Maureen, and Susan. Hello, friends. We're here in New York today not only to celebrate the incredible progress that we've made towards local and sustainable food systems, but to express our gratitude to the many brilliant, thoughtful, and dedicated people who make this happen every single day. Many of you are here with us this weekend, farmers, chefs, writers, publishers, artists. Thank you for everything that you do. We also know where this all starts, in the ground beneath our feet, preferably ground that is not far from our dinner tables, whether that's a community garden plot in Brooklyn, or a school rooftop garden in Manhattan, or a dairy farm in the nearby countryside. You bring this message to the people of your community because you are the true bridge builders between the people who eat and the people who produce and prepare food. Local and regional production and distribution have been a part of the Organic Valley model from the very start, which is why New Yorkers get Organic Valley products from the Northeast. When you purchase New York fresh milk, you directly support local New York farmers like Susan Hardy and Maureen Knapp. As we see with the many facets of nature, we are all connected. The food chain, from the smallest life in the ocean to the fish on our plate, the organic soil and pasture for our cows to the food that we eat, the recycling we do relating to the health of our planet, it's all really so very important. We feel that same importance with you, the edible writers and subscribers, helping to extend the circle of our mission. It takes all of us doing our jobs with the same goal to educate about and execute this mission. We are bringing the good. We do our best by farming organically and providing healthy fare to consumers, exhibiting transparency and building trust in our brand, and we appreciate you continuing the support by connecting to consumers via the beautiful photos and the verbal portraits of local food stories that you do so well. Our combined accomplishments surely have created and solidified our aligned mission, and we appreciate and thank you so much for your dedicated efforts. Could you roll the video, please? Thank you. A right of the season is putting the cows out to pasture. Organic Valley farmers across the nation look forward to that day. Because of circumstances created by Mother Nature, that day varies from farm to farm. As you can see here, it's not just the farmers who look forward to this, but the cows themselves. <laughs> they can certainly sense when that grass is ready. Pasture land contains lots of different kinds of grasses. It's like a salad bar for cows. And they choose the plants to eat by what their bodies crave and need. Look at how happy those girls are. <laughs> Pasturing the animals also gives them exercise, fresh air, and time to hang out with their cow buddies. It also lets them leave behind those very important nutrients in the fields. We as organic farmers devote our lives to the health and well-being of the planet and our animals. 
Pasturing reinforces our efforts and gives us very happy cows. In fact, sometimes we even catch them smiling. We have always known in our hearts and through our experience that pasturing is the center of farming and produces better, more healthful food. Better for the soil, better for the plants, animals, people, and environment. And now we have proof. In December of last year, in the leading open source scientific journal, Plus One, the University of Washington published a study, the largest and most comprehensive to date, that clearly demonstrates the nutritional excellence of organic whole milk. The key nutritional components of milk, essential fatty acids, omega-3, and CLAs, are dramatically higher in organic whole milk than conventional milk. Just as important for human health, the study shows the ideal ratio of omega-6s to omega-3s. The organic milk analyzed in the study comes from Organic Valley Family Farms. The reason for this elevated nutrition is Organic Valley's deep commitment to pasture-based farming. When cows eat well, so do we. Please be sure to take home a copy of our Bringing the Balance, which includes more details about the study and the benefits of drinking organic whole milk. This has been such a wonderful opportunity for us to speak with you all today. Thank you so much for supporting our brand. It means so much to myself, Susan, and Maureen, and all of our Organic Valley farmers to be here amongst friends. Thank you.